The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Welcome to our webinar, and thank you for attending. My name is Ryan Metcalf. I'm the Sales and Marketing Director for Pollen Research Group. We thank you for attending today. In today's webinar, our president, Tony Pollen, will demonstrate some key and exciting new functionality that will be made available to our customers who are current on support. These new programs and new features will be part of our major new version release, version 10.0 of FE Pipe and version 12.0 of Nozzle Pro. This major version release will be officially announced to all current and past customers in the very near future. Please visit our website in the next few weeks to see a summary of the upcoming webinars. We have planned to introduce the new programs and functionality, functionality that will be part of this release. We have planned seven more webinars over the next four to five months. If you have questions during this webinar, please use the questions area of the GoToWebinar controls. We will flag questions to be answered at the end of today's session. If your question does not get answered today, we will try to answer them in the next few days by email. If you are experiencing any problems with the webinar, like sound or speed, please use the chat feature to send us a message. Today's webinar will be recorded. Please check back with us early next week if you are interested in downloading a recorded video of today's webinar. We'd like to start today's webinar now, so I will be handing control over to Tony Paulin. Tony will be joined today by Willie Locke, one of our senior development engineers here at PRG. And with that, Tony, in just a few seconds, the mic and controls will be yours. Okay, thank you, Ryan. The title of today's webinar is B31J 2017 Details. Boss B31, we're going to look at two-phase flow and water hammer and steady state and transient thermal loads in pipe shoes, gussets, vessels, saddles, clips, and nozzles. The purpose of this webinar is really to talk about the what and the how of these topics. B31J 2017 was released recently and will affect your pipe stress because it corrects errors in existing calculations and in doing so provides more consistent safety factors and more economical piping systems. The piping systems are more economical mainly because gross over conservatisms, which we're gonna talk about quite a bit today, were made when four inch size on size pipe tests in the 50s were extrapolated to everything else. B31J eliminated that extrapolation. When designers use B31J, it's believed that there will be many fewer hours spent in unnecessary redesign and support of the piping systems. And that's what we're hopefully going to see through the examples today. BOSS B31 is considered a complement to B31J. Uh, B31J helps design all of the pipe properly, but if only one dynamic system fails, that can, of course, bring the plant down and cost millions of dollars. So this is where BOSS B31 comes in. Inexperience, rush to completion, lack of oversight, inferior products from the lowest bidder, all of these have been seen to contribute to plant problems and vibration. Thin stuff, cheap stuff, smaller stuff just seems to shake more. So what we'd like to be able to do is to identify those shaking systems before they start to shake so that we can add a few supports while the problem is still only on paper. Boss B31 is intended to do that. It's a uh, unique, Boss B31 is a unique frequency domain, uh, fluid structure interaction program that takes advantage of common rules of thumb for fluid loading uh, to conservatively pinpoint uh, piping system problem areas. We're going to use Boss B31 today to do just that for a fairly large piping system. Additionally, thermal starting and stopping or changing often causes more problems in the plant than cost, constant operation or vibration. So steady state and transient solutions, heat transfer solutions in the new Nozzle Pro will help designers ask the right questions from the process engineer about stopping, starting, or changing, and will give designers tools, to, and, uh, tools and guidance to help evaluate the stress states that arise from these, these fluid uh, uh, and thermal transients. 
Okay, so we want to start with B31J details. So there are a number of things in B31J whose origins go back to WRC 329 and the 10 changes to B311 and B313 recommended by Ev Rodeball in WRC 329. Ev focused more on getting the right answer. But now as we implement these seemingly more reasonable solutions, we see that they can have a very significant economic impact because routing that we thought was overstressed really is not overstressed. And as importantly, sustained and occasional stresses are also addressed by B31J and do tend to follow the same trend. We're gonna see that hopefully in the examples today. In uh, WRC 329, Ev used the example of an unloaded vent or drain line on a quote unquote large run pipe to illustrate current gross over conservatisms. As it turns out, many D over D branch connections where the D over D ratio is less than one suffer from similar run side branch over conservatisms. The piping system that we're gonna look at here in just a second includes a 14 inch branch and a 20 inch run and significantly suffers from this problem. So the first thing I'd like to do is get a few definitions out of the way. So. Here is the definition of the stress intensification factor the way it's used now. The code objective is to calculate the stress and make sure it's less than the allowable. The calculated stress is equal to a nominal stress times a factor. The factor for the SE calculation for the expansion calculation is the SIF. The nominal stress is the moment in the, the matching piping system divided by the section modulus in the pipe. The nominal stress for axial loads is the axial force in the, the matching pipe divided by the area of the axial pipe. The uh, equations that we see in the code, we see, we see along the bottom here, the stress is the moment divided by the section modulus in the pipe times the stress intensification factor. The section modulus is defined by typically two equations, the approximate equation, pi r squared t, and the exact equation that you see here on the right. So these are equations that we'll be using over and over again. Okay, let's go take a look at a warm oil line where the branch connection is a 14 by 20, which is D over D of 0.7. Now this is the classical Schneider problem and B31, B31J shows the classical Schneider bump in the out of plane through the branch loading SIF that's considered by B31J. So when everybody looks at this problem, they would say, okay, we know what's gonna happen. The branch out of plane SIF is gonna be lower. But the most significant issue in this problem is the run side over conservatism that exists when D over D is less than one that is in the existing uh, 2016 version of Appendix D. This happens because, which is identified in WRC 329, II, for the run and IO for the run should be switched. And in general, when the D over D ratio is less than one, II for the run and IO for the run are both too high. So what we wanna do is we wanna see that. The critical nodes in the piping system are shown in this slide. So we're, we're interested in what's going on in the run. So we've got 60 to 70 is a run, run side branch pipe or run side pipe coming into the intersection and 70 to 80 is the run side pipe leaving the branch connection. This is the calculated stresses. So here is an example Caesar stress report. We've got stress intensification factors in plane and out of plane of 4.6 and 5.9. This oil line is overstressed. It's overstressed at node 70. It's overstressed in the elements 60 to 70 and 70 to 80. So this is in the run pipe. So we know that this is a D over D branch connection less than one. We're overstressed in the run pipe. Is this a problem with the code? Is this a known issue? Is more applicable data going to solve our problem? Do we need to reroute the pipe? Do we need to support it more? Or is this just a mistake? So what we'd like to do is let's run Caesar and run FEA tools and check. So this model name is I-N-T-E-R-M. So Willie will start Caesar. Everything we're going to do today is uh, going to be run live. So there's the model. OK, 
Okay, so let's bring it up, Willie, and let's uh, make the stress calculation. Okay, so we're interested in looking at the sustained stresses because we saw that those were overstressed and we saw we had an overstressed condition there. Okay, so here we are 60 to 70, 70 to 80. The calculated stress is 23,000. 661 PSI and the in-plane SIF is 4.65 and the out-of-plane SIF, which we uh, we uh, have questions about now, basically because of what we've just talked about. We want to see how accurate those values are. So what we'll do is we will use FEA tool to check these stress intensification factors. We'd like to do it quickly. There is a tool available in FEA tools where you can bring it up. It's called PRGIK. Well, he's bringing it up now. This is available on your, your Caesar uh, version 10 disks. So when you install the uh, FEA Tools Essentials, you have access to this program. The SIF and SSI and K spreadsheet is here. So when you click on it, you, you will get exactly what Willie and I are going to get. So we bring it up. We're going to enter this branch connection. So it's a 20 inch branch by 375 and a 14 inch wall also by 375. So standard wall, branch and run. Once we've entered the piping systems, once we've entered the, uh, the piping system geometry, we compute the I's and K's here. Now, we're not interested in SIFs. We're interested in sustained stress indices that were introduced in B313. So we're coming down here to the sustained stress indices button and pressing that because the I factors here, we're not so interested in. We're interested in the sustained stresses because it was the sustained stress cases that were overloaded. So we click on that button. And here what we see are the SIFs we're using versus the SIFs that we would be using as recommended by B31J. So for an unreinforced fabricated T, we have 4.6 is the in-plane through the run, which we saw in the seizure result, and 5.9 in the out-of-plane through the run. If we look at the recommendation from B31J, we see in-plane 1.9 and out-of-plane 1.0. So the, the stress intensification factors for sustained stresses are significantly different. So do we believe this number? We go back and look at B31J. B31J gives us a test procedure. Once we make the, the, the test procedure, once we run a test on a geometry, we get something called a twice elastic slope. From the twice elastic slope, which is the M2 moment defined in the, uh, the test procedure in B31J, we can drop it into this equation and we can replace the term 0.75i by the tested value. Let's take a look quickly at what these look like, what these, uh, these tests look like. So here is a, a typical uh, B31J sustained stress failure twice elastic slope test. So what we want to do is we'd like to make the calculation so that we can compare it to the test data because that's where the B31J recommendations came from. So Willie's going to start FE pipe as it turns out here because that's where we've got this geometry model. And this is just for demonstration purposes. So let's Let's go to that job, Willie. You can plot it to just a simple cantilever. This is a crude mesh so that it runs fairly quickly. And what we want to do is we want to expose it to the collapse test. So let's start the collapse process. It's set up for that. And what we watch is we watch the software load the geometry until it collapses. Let's go take a look. While we're making the calculation, and we can see it's already started plastically straining, while we're letting it make the calculation, we want to go back and look at the actual test results. 
So let's pull up the movie of the test, please. So what we're doing now is we're making the calculation to reproduce this simulation. So you can see the local failure at the bottom. Let's take a quick look at that local failure. There's another video here that's a close up of the local failure. This is what the local failure looks like as it begins to open the, the section. <clears throat> And now let's go take a look at what the test data plots like and how it is going to compare to the calculation we're making. Okay, so what you see here is the blue line. This is the load versus displacement from the test we just saw. At the point that you, uh, Willie's got the cursor pointing at now, that is the point where we first started to develop the material separation that you saw in the second video. The dashed lines are the different lines for different material geometries. We put the different yield strength materials on here to show that most of the geometries follow the test data pretty well along the line until they start dropping off. So we're, uh, this is a fairly dependable test and it's a fairly dependable calculation. So we're hopefully just about ready with the, uh, the calculation, but uh, I can see it's still running in the background, Willie. So let's take a quick look at uh, Section 8, Division 2, Part 5 rules that define this material separation. So what's going to happen is that if you end up, and I'm not suggesting that you will, but you could, if you want to try to simulate the, the failure mechanism that we're, we saw on that test, you would go to Section 8, Division 2, Part 5, uh, Paragraph 5.3.3.1, and make this calculation for the allowed plastic strain. It gives you the reduced value for a triaxial, not a triax, but a, a, a three-dimensional stress state in a finite element geometry. This calculation is made automatically in uh, the new version of Nozzle Pro and FE Pipe. The run is just finished. Here is the, the uh, what we see here is the display shape versus the load. In this case, we load it up, we uh, hit the, the maximum load capacity, load begins to drop, we've displaced at 12 inches. The displacement in the previous plot that we saw was only through four inches. The displacement at uh, 12 inches now, because the geometry is turned vertical, begins to strengthen again. So we're well into gross plastic deformation in this calculation. Now, this is not, as it turns out, this is not what we want to do for twice elastic slope, but the capability is here if you need it. The twice elastic slope criteria for collapse, if we go back to the slides, Will, is what's, to, what's used in section three to define collapse. This is what's used in B31J. It's also used in all of section three. The twice elastic slope test is a fairly simple test in that you load the geometry so that plastically it gets to a point where the actual displacements are twice the elastic displacements. So relatively small loads. We're going to see that in a minute. If we look at the next slide, this is basically the accrued history of where the twice elastic slope test came from. It was originally used in the 1960s as one of the tests to set the criteria for the piping code today. In uh, the B317 nuclear code split off in around 1967. It became section three for the nuclear side, and it became section eight, division two for the petrochemical and uh, uh, non nuclear fossil side. Section eight, division two became 2007, or in the became, well, there was a division two rewrite, rewrite in 2007. Then in 2017, B31J was released, which also includes the twice elastic slope method. So the twice elastic slope method has been around a long time. It's incorporated directly into Nozzle Pro and FE Pipe. The all I want to say here is essentially the calculation is made automatically for you. So we saw 
how the procedure is or, or what the, the, the purpose of the test is and the fact that we're doing an elastic plastic calculation, what we'd like to do now is run the elastic plastic calculation to simulate the tests for the 14 by 20 geometry. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to run that test for you right here live. So if we can start Nozzle Pro, Willie. And for those of you that have bought Nozzle Pro either from Intergraph or from Pollen Research Group, version 12 of Nozzle Pro has this capability in it for you. So let's start a new file. It's going to be a 20 inch by 0.375 wall run by 14 inch and 0.375 wall branch. We're going to save the geometry. So model name A. We go to options. We want this to run a little bit faster, so we'll set it the mesh multiplier to 0 0.5. We'll look at a, uh, a chart a little bit later that shows that we really don't see too much effect on uh, twice elastic slope development with, with coarse finite element meshes which makes it hard to mess up. Now, what we want to do is we would like to ask the software to generate the twice elastic slope curves for us. So we click on plastic analysis options. We tell it that we want to run plasticity and large rotation. We tell it that we want to evaluate the sustained stress indices without design pressure for the run. And we're interested in the in-plane and out-of-plane SSIs. The yield strengths for our material for an A106 grade B pipe is 35,000 PSI yield and 60,000 PSI tensile strength. And that's what we need to develop the elastic plastic uh, curve. That's all that we need to do. We press OK. All right, it's going to make the calculation for loads through the run. Say OK, and we make the click on Run Plastic FEA. And what you'll see here is the same screen that we saw before. So the load factor increases until we hit the twice elastic slope load. Previously, we calculated the uh, collapse load. Now we're interested in the twice elastic slope load. So we've already finished the in-plane calculation. And we've just finished the out of plane calculation. These calculations are incredibly fast. As we scroll through the output, we see that for the, we're in the in plane calculation, the in plane SSI is 1.2. You remember the in plane from the Caesar calculation from 0.75i in the existing B313, Appendix D was 4.6. We look at the out of plane, the out of plane was six or around six. Here the SSI is one. So we think these are, are very reasonable values. So if we go back to the table, Willie. So here are the in-plane and the out-of-plane factors for the sustained stresses. So Appendix D and B313-2016 says the value should be 0.75i. We know that that's too high, especially for run pipes, for the SIFs and the SSIs. So in plane 4.6, out of plane 5.9 or 6. B31J, SIF times 0.75 gives us 2.7 and 1 for the out of plane. The B31J sustained factor guidance gives us 1.9 versus 1. B31J also contains more applicable data. So the more applicable data calculation gives us 1.5 and 1.02. That's the calculation we just made. Or no, I take that back. The, the calculation we just made isn't on this slide. So if we go to the next slide, here's the FEA calculation with a mesh multiplier of 0.5. That's 1.2. And the out of plane is 1. If we increase the mesh multiplier to 1.5, it runs a little bit longer but we still have an in-plane SSI of 1.2 compared to an out-of-plane factor of one. So essentially everything tells us one or 1 1.2 and the values that we're using today in the code 4.6 and six. Those are the recognized grossly over conservative values. So let's go uh, finish this run, Willie. 
so we can pull in interim. We can make the B31J calculation. Right? Mm -hmm. So now that we, we feel comfortable with what we're doing, we think the answers are gonna be uh, phenomenal and much more reasonable. We start the Caesar translator. We pick the job name. This is all software that's available on your Caesar 10 disk under essentials. We select B31J 2017. We convert the model to B31J 2017. says the model's been successfully converted. We can scroll down and look at the results. Sure enough, we see exactly the same type of 4.6, 6, 1.9, 6, and 1. These are the recommended values that we'll use with B31J. We've already converted the model, so now we want to run it. Again, all of this is on your CD with Caesar version 10. We want to do the comparison. So we're calculated with B31J. The displacements are about the same. Common stress elements are about the same, but the stresses around the branch connections are significantly different. If we look at the charts or the 3D plots, what we see is that indeed the original model was 118% overstressed. And now the maximum stress in the model is 33%. There's no reason to, uh, to redesign or, or resupport uh, these piping systems where the run side sifts with D over D when D over D is less than one are so significantly high. What Willie's showing here is the sustained stress plots. We can see based on the original model that we've definitely got two nodes that are above the allowables. And if we go look at that same plot, we can see that none of the nodes in the model are even close to the allowable plane. So this is far more significant uh, or far more uh, realistic. Okay, let's take a look at another uh, B31J example model. What we have here is a small bore branch connection in a, an eight inch schedule 20 pipe. The branch is two inch double extra strong, so it's got a, a 0.4 inch wall thickness in the branch. And in the run pipe, it's schedule 20, so we have a 0.25 inch wall thickness in the, in the run pipe. So again, when you see a system like this now, the first thing that comes to, to my mind anyway is that through the run, I'm likely or could easily have uh, overestimated, over conservative sifts for my, uh, my run pipes for both sustain and expansion cases. Okay, so we want to continue to talk about just for a second here, a consistent definition of the SIFs. This model does not have pressure. Pressure stress intensification factors and nominals are a different ball of wax. Uh, B31J addresses that also. We use guidance from uh, the nuclear code. This is the section three uh, equation. People uh, get confused because it tends to be uh, well, it's got a lot more terms in it. These are all thermal terms, which we don't need. The next set of terms on the right are the 2i or the stress intensification factor and the nominal bending stress. The term to the left is the pressure stress term. When you wanna use pressure in a piping system, you can do so via B31J, but the pressure inclusion uh, and getting pressure uh, fatigue analysis in a piping system, the uh, rules need to be applied properly. And uh, this will be the, the subject of another webinar because it is, uh, it's a little bit different than just uh, I times M over Z. Here is the uh, branch connection node in this piping system. We see that it's over the allowable. So the stress is 68,000 PSI as calculated by the existing 2016 B31D. So now let's take a look at the loads. Here are the loads in the piping system. 
So there's the in-plane moment, which is very high, and there's the axial load in node 60 and the 50 to 60. So that's along the run. So we'll make the run calculation first to see if the run sifts and stresses are okay. Here's the section modulus and the area for the run. And again, for the run, we're trying to match 24,900 PSI. So the axial stress is F over A. So the force divided by the area is 1,400 PSI. That's the axial nominal stress. The bending nominal stress is M over Z. So that's the bending moment times 12 to get it into inch pounds divided by the section modulus. That's 3,400 PSI. So we've got 3,400 PSI bending nominal an axial stress of 1,400 PSI nominal, and a code stress of 24,000 PSI. So now we take a look at the stress intensification factors, because indeed it's those that elevate the stresses. So if we start with the in-plane and the bending, the bending nominal is 34. We multiply by the stress intensification factor and get 16,210. For the axial, B31.3 tells us to take the axial F over A stress and for branch connections to multiply by IO. So we multiply the 1400 PSI nominal axial stress by 5.8 and get 8400 PSI. Now let's take a look at where that equation uh, comes from in the code. So here is equation 17 in the code. For our model, we don't have any torsion. So torsion is left out. Now what we can see is that we definitely have an axial load and a bending load. So they are summed, squared, and then the square root is taken. So SE for this problem is simply the absolutes or the, the sum, the direct sum of the axial and the bending stresses. The axial stresses are defined as SA, which is IA, FA over A sub P. IA is defined below, and IA for branch connections is equal to IO. So that's where the 5.892 times the 1400 PSI came from. So now if we add these two stresses together, 16,000 plus 8,000, there's our 24,000 PSI. So this makes perfect sense, okay? So now we wanna ask the question is, do we think we're gonna get the right stress from this calculation? There are the SIFs that we're using. This is what we would be using for B31J. When we make the FEA calculation, we see, again, very similar and very low numbers. So the, the stress calculation here, not using more applicable data is too high. Using more applicable data is gonna be considerably lower. We take a look at the result. Here's what the result will look like. Here's the first calculation in the top, which is in red. We're 139% overstressed. Once we put more applicable data in, were 54% of the allowable stress. We've explained the 24,000 PSI. So now what I'd like to do is quickly go through the same process for the branch. So for the branch, we have stresses that are, okay, next slide please, next slide please. So for the branch, we have stresses that are 68,000. Okay. And there's our branch, 60 to 100. There's the 60 to 100 element. So we're trying to explain the 68,000. And we think that we should go through the same calculation that we made before. So we'll clear some space to work. We'll pull up the axial loads. Here's the axial loads in the two inch branch. Here's the section modulus in the area. So we've got the loads. The axial stress is small or negligible, even with a five times stress intensification factor, so we can ignore the axial stress. Here is the bending stress. So the bending stress, the nominal bending stress is 7,700 PSI, so a little bit higher value. We need to apply the SIFs. Okay, this we can see from the geometry, this, the moment is gonna be an out-of-plane bending moment. So we're gonna take the out-of-plane SIF, So we take the out-of-plane SIF and multiply by the axial stress like we did before and see that, okay, that's a small number. Next, next slide. Here's the bending. So we take the out-of-plane SIF, multiply by the nominal 7,700. There's 45,000 
45,000 doesn't match the calculated value from the, uh, the Caesar. We're off by 1.5 times. So what's wrong here? Okay, if we go to the equations, okay, here are the equations we use, here's the I factors we use. There's nothing too fancy here until we start looking at them in more detail. For this problem, we said the SA stress is small, the torsional stress is small. So essentially SE is, is just SB. SB for the branch is the stress intensification factors times the moments divided by the effective section modulus, not the branch section modulus and that is the difference the actual section modulus is pi r squared times the thickness of the branch or more accurately this equation for z the effective section modulus calculation is pi r squared ts where ts is the lesser of the thickness of the header or itv if we take a look at our problem the thickness for the header is definitely less than ITB because I is big, TB is big, and TH is small. This will characteristically happen to you when you're using long weld necks or when you're using double extra strong branches in standard wall run pipe. So in those cases, you will produce this issue. Okay. So TS is equal to TH. So as we continue through the calculation, SB now is IM over Z sub E. Z sub E is IM over pi R squared TS. TS is TH. As we see here, we're going to multiply this equation by 1, which is TB over TB. We're going to switch TB and TH so that the calculation we made originally was IM over the section modulus of the branch, this one. What the code tells us to do is take our original calculation and multiply by TB over TH, where in this case, TB is the, the thicker bran uh, branch run over the TH, the thinner uh, run pipe run. So you know what's gonna happen. That gives us the increased ratio, 45 essentially to 68,000. So the question we have is, is that correct? Is, is that the way we're supposed to do that? Let's take a quick look, and there's a number of slides here that we'll hand out. Let's take a quick look at what B31J says. B31J says we never want to use the effective section modulus again. It was put in in the 1960s. Ev wrote questions about it in 1961. It's definitely got some issues. Now the stress intensification factor equations include the proper relationship with T over T. So we don't need an artificial effective section modulus calculation anymore. In 1961, Ev pointed out that, gee, the use of the effective section modulus and the multiplication by T over T might cause artificially low problems when the T over T ratio is less than one. Or it might cause, like we're seeing here, artificially high problems when the T over T ratio is greater than one. So this is another aspect of B31J that's correct, corrected, both in B31J and in FEA tools. Okay, now what we'd like to do is we'd like to move on to BOSS B31. Again, all of these slides will be available and we'll be happy to answer any detailed questions about them. So Willie, if we can bring up the model. So again, all of this is available on your CSER version 10 disk. This is part of the BOSS B31 Essentials package, so you don't need a separate license for BOSS B31. So if we bring up BOSS B31, we're going to pick the first job here. We want to take a, a look at it. Okay. So we've got two-phase flow, and we've got water hammer. So rapid valve closure will be our water hammer problem. Okay, we want to, can we take a look at the model, Willie? Okay, so here's the geometry. So you can see there's quite a bit of piping here. A lot of little pipe, a lot of big pipe. Okay, so this is the system that we want to analyze for two-phase flow and for water hammer. Okay, so we click two-phase flow, we click, 
click rapid valve closure, and we click next. Here is the BOSS B31 input for the fluid loadings. Under elements, it pulls out all of the estimated data from the piping system. From the, uh, the element screen for large models, we can eliminate parts of the system that we're not interested in. We can eliminate flow calculations for trunnions on bends, for little pipe, for vessels, for things we don't want. So this is a convenience feature to help speed the runs up for large models like this one. So we've eliminated some elements in the exclusion list and we click OK. We're ready to perform the boss analysis. Again, we're going to, this is being run live now. So let's run the calculation mode. So we're going out and doing a, a, an acoustic frequency analysis of the piping system. So there were 100 frequencies calculated. There are the frequencies. And here are the relative forces on each elbow-elbow pair. Okay, so now we need the mechanical natural frequencies or the mechanical characteristics of the system. I put in exactly the same node exclusion ranges that were parts of the system we weren't interested in. And so we click on the run mechanical analysis. And when this finishes, what we'll have is the mechanical natural frequencies and mode shapes and the acoustic natural frequencies and mode shapes. So this will take just a second. What it's doing here is preparing all the reaction loads, all the displacements, and all the stresses so that we can do what if calculations in uh, very short order. Because what we want to do when we're finished here is we want to go back and decide if it's two phase flow or water hammer that's causing the problem. And then we want to see if we've got any parts of the system where we should add supports. So it's making all the stress calculations now. Again, in anticipation of rapid combination in just a minute. Okay, here's all of the mechanical natural frequencies. Those can all be plotted. You can plot one or more of them together if you want. There's the first natural frequency that's available. Can we stick a few on that plot one? So we can plot them in sequence if we want to see how one compares to the next, compares to the next. So we can step between them, we can compare modes. So hopefully this makes it easy to very quickly identify areas in the piping system where we don't have proper supporting. But again, this is still just the mechanical calculation. So what we need to see is where we have acoustic mechanical interaction. So now we step on to the next uh, screen, where, which is the uh, dynamic effects screen. Here we put in the same node range exclusions. And now we want to calculate stresses and forces and moments and reaction loads due to water hammer and two-phase flow. OK, we want to put the valve closure time of one. Willie and I changed that just before we started. Uh, so one is the default. So we'll use a valve closure time of one second. OK. Here's the stress calculation. You'll notice in the beginning, it tells us two-phase flow may be present. It makes the calculation in two-phase flow based on an average bubble diameter, which can be changed. There's a rapid valve closure, and here are the parameters that affect it. The valve closure time is clearly one of those. One of the first things we look at is the 2D frequencies. The 2D frequencies show us where we have mechanical excitation, and yeah, we do see a little bit of acoustic excitation going on, a lot more at higher frequencies. Not so interesting here, Stresses are interesting. We have 14,000 PSI stress in this relatively short run piping system due to two-phase flow and water hammer. Let's look at the 3D plots, Willie, please. How much displacement do we have due to the maximum of two-phase flow and water hammer? So we can click through the displacements. Here's the Y displacement, 1.89 inches is a maximum in the Y, half inch in the Z, and what was it in the X, Will? 1.9 inches in the, in the X. So if we want to look at the system moving, 
the movement here, and if we can move, look at it from the top a little bit, the X direction movement, the maximum movement in this plot is about two inches. And that produces about 14,000 PSI. So is it the water hammer or is it the, uh, the two-phase flow? So let's go find out. So we'll go back to the dynamic effects input. We'll click off water hammer and we'll perform the analysis again. What if cases are performed almost instantaneously? So we click on run dynamic effects. In the beginning, we see we still have two phase flow, but that rapid valve closure is not included. Okay, so now we can check stresses again. 14,000 PSI. So water hammer doesn't contribute to our 14,000 PSI stress, two-phase flow produces the 14,000 PSI and the displacement. What about the water hammer? What would happen if we had a shorter valve closure time? Let's go find out. We go back to the dynamic effects input. We want to turn on water hammer. We want to turn off two-phase flow, and we want to go to advanced data and reduce the valve closure time to what Willie and I used before. Let's use 0.01 inch. 0.01 second, a very short valve closure time, and see if it has an impact on this relatively short run system. So we say, okay. We go back to the dynamic effects calculation form and press run. 0.01 second gives us stresses of 3000 PSI, very small, short lengths of run, the water hammer wave doesn't interact with us. This is how BOSS B31 is intended to be used. In the 3D plots, when these are animating, what we see here is parts of the system that are moving a lot and parts of the system that aren't. Dropping in supports to prevent this type of movement is a, a very convenient and now it's an inexpensive thing to do. Okay, Willie, can we take a look now at uh, thermal transients? We will do this by example. In the version 12 of Nozzle Pro, we're gonna go to a model that Willie already built of a pipe shoe. Okay, can we plot this geometry? I think we can. I wonder if it's a good idea to turn off some of the things in the back. Yeah. And something's dragging, oh, there it is. But something's dragging things down. So this is the pipe shoe, so relatively simple system. And what we'd like to do is we would like to run a, a steady state heat transfer or transient heat transfer analysis on it. Then we'd like to take the thermal distribution and include it with our loads and do a stress analysis. So to do the thermal analysis, Willie goes to options. You see a new tab, thermal gradient on structural supports in the bottom right hand corner. So Willie will click on that. We want to include the thermal loads with the external loads. To turn them off, you click the that checkbox off. Loads, thermal loads aren't included. Click it on, thermal loads are included. There's transient analysis opportunity and there's steady state. With the transient analysis off, we just do a steady state analysis. When Willie clicks this, the view, Thermal gradient 2D plots button. Here is the calculated thermal profile. This thermal profile will now be superimposed on the model. We can also generate transient profiles. So we say, okay, here, this model's ready to run. So we'll perform the analysis. Well, you can also look at the thermal gradient along the, the shoe support. Okay. So we'll plot, they actually already plotted it. Under model verification, there is a view 3D properties. And you can select the inside temperature. You'll see a temperature gradient along the, the, ax, uh, the height of the shoe. Uh, let me change this to linear so you get a better look. 
uh, using the thermometer tool here, you can inspect the temperature gradient. So it'll start at the hot temperature and gradually drop down to 300 degrees or 250 degrees to the bottom, to the base of the, of the shoe. So now it's ready to run. Okay, so let's go ahead and run it. There are typical inputs you may have noticed on the thermal design screen, uh, insulation, insulation uh, conductivity, in, uh, insulation length down the pipe shoe. So these are, hopefully we covered the majority of the applicable parameters that you need to do that calculation. Yeah, I wonder if we want to close things in the back, will we? Do you think it's slowing things down a little bit? I'd mind. But not too much, not too much, is it okay? Okay, so here's the stress analysis, external loads plus the thermal thermal evaluation. Since we're running out of time, what we'd like to do is uh, we can take a look at this. The output uh, slides will be in the webinar on the uh, webinar slides on the uh, internet. Now, what we'd like to do is look at a button that you haven't seen before which is the drawing tool set. There's now a drawing tool set in both FE pipe and nozzle pro. So what we want to do is we want to use the drawing tool set on the pipe shoe or the pipe before we run the FEA analysis. We can build a wide variety of geometries from this. What I'd like to do again, since we're about out of time is we'll just add a, a plate. We could add additional supports if we wanted to. We could remove supports, we could remove uh, boundary conditions, we could remove elements. But what we'll do is to try to improve the strength is we're going to add a flat plate along the front of the pipe chute, just as an example. So what we'll do is there's red dots at every point where we can connect or define a curve. So Willie will ask to add a curve and select points along the flat plate where we want to attach the plate that's moving horizontally. So you see the yellow light. Oops, we need to back away from that one. It's in the wrong place. So you can see the node was in the wrong area. Five, six, seven. Okay, so that's the edge of one side of our plate. So we go to the opposite side. And we need to add another curve. Well, it was adding curves to the last mm -hmm. curve, okay. So now we have two curves. We go to add elements. And between curve one and curve two, we want six elements. And we build the elements. Ah, uh, two, three, four, five, six. six we six, need six, another six. one, two, three, four, five. So we need another point. <clears throat> yep, should be all right. Two, so right here. And select points. Okay, now we can add elements. Okay, so if we zoom out a little bit and so here's the elements. So we got them, they're a little bit crooked. All right, so they can be removed and so forth. But now what we wanna do is we wanna go through the design iteration here. We click on update, we prepare for analysis. Oops, we forgot to identify the property. We're gonna put in default English units, one, one. Create the property. Now we should be ready to prepare. Here's the new model. So when we zoom in on the new model, we can see we have indeed added our plate. We can submit for analysis. And we can use the new post processor to post process results here, make changes again here, submit for analysis again here, et cetera. 
So the design process or the design iteration can be made around the graphic, graphic processor. What happened? <clears throat> Ah, okay. So we didn't wait until it was finished. Yeah. We need to grab one of the thermal cases. Yeah. So the case three here. Yeah. So the plate is included in the, the calculation, along with the external loads that we have. Okay. So now if we can go back to the, uh, and then if you can, so these are the, uh, uh, Ryan went through this already. So here are the webinars that we'll be uh, giving, hopefully, uh, uh, going through example illustrations like this uh, more detail in the future uh, with the uh, can you pull up that word document one of the things that we've been asked most often for additional plates and uh, constructions for uh, pressure vessel geometries is to add gussets uh, this is an example using the tool that you just saw for putting gussets around nozzles essentially plates can be added just about anywhere that there are already dots on your geometry so uh, I think Ryan, we're ready to take any questions. If folks would like to, uh, to ask questions about what they've seen. Okay, uh, question uh, number one is, where did the factors listed as B31J more applicable data and guidance come from in the software? If you take a look at B31J and read through the scope uh, portion of the document and then uh, read through all of the notes in the table 1.1, you'll see what B31J is intended to replace in terms of SIFs and how those SIFs should be used. Uh, if you look at the uh, test described in Appendix D, you'll see how the Appendix D test process is used for uh, developing the uh, 0.75i for sustained stress replacements. Uh, I will uh, also respond via email uh, to this questioner. There have been, since P31J has been worked on, there have been a number of papers presented at the PVP conferences that provide the background data starting from the 1967 nuclear code that show how the 0.75i values were arrived at, how the twice elastic slope test is used to develop 0.75i, and then the correlations that are used in B31J with the I factors to, uh, to get that value for both uh, B31J and section three. Uh, the next question is, can SSIs and SIFs be compared directly? Uh, the answer to that is yes and no. Uh, the, because the, the SIF as a basis starts with the discontinuity stress in an elastic geometry for many piping system uh, components, the uh, discontinuity stress is a good indicator of collapse. And so we can make the twice elastic slope uh, test, we can make the twice elastic slope calculation with a finite element analysis, and then we can look at how it compares to I factors, and we can see that there are indeed strong correlations for a large number of uh, common geometries. Uh, here's another, uh, another question I was involved in the past with calculations of uh, LNG lines on a jetty. Yep, these lines can become hot when I, and cold when in service, absolutely. Cooling down is not the same over the, absolutely, not the same over the length of the line. This creates high forces from one side of the line stop first, yep. Uh, later the forces level up, yep. How are the forces uh, and maximum forces over time on line stops calculated? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is a thermal transient problem. I mean, that's for sure. Fortunately, it's not a dynamic problem and uh, almost not a, a transient problem because you can speculate the, uh, the temperature profiles. So you calculate the temperature profiles, you do make a transient calculation if necessary, uh, determine the maximum loads and their direction on the pipe shoes. And then using this tool, you would put those in the 
the, the, the pipe shoe calculation in Nozzle Pro. If you built those models in Caesar, in Caesar you would run the, the simula a simulation of each of the thermal profiles, and then the allowable loads from Nozzle Pro can be used in the Caesar via FEA tools. So you would use FEA tools on the Caesar models of the different thermal transients to determine if there's too much load on the pipe shoes. Well, I think we've uh, we've taken enough time. Uh, we'll try to respond to all of the other questions uh, via email and by uh, adding responses to the end of these slides uh, when we put them on the website. Uh, thank everybody for uh, for attending, and I look forward to the next webinar. Thank you.